Speaker Mike Johnson has presented a plan to prevent a partial government shutdown by proposing that the House vote on four separate appropriations bills and potentially pass a stopgap funding bill. The tight schedule and potential delays, including possible obstruction from senators like Rand Paul, pose a threat of a brief shutdown. Some lawmakers expressed concerns about differences in appropriations bills, particularly regarding funding for agencies like agriculture, military construction veterans affairs, energy water, and transportation housing and urban development. The House aims to vote on these bills next week to meet the Friday deadline. While Johnson prefers to avoid another stopgap measure. It might be necessary for another week or two. The far-right House Freedom Caucus advocated for a year-long stopgap bill, but Johnson resisted due to concerns about defense spending cuts. He also highlighted the GOP's weakened negotiating position in the Democratic-led Senate, partly attributing it to the House Republicans' struggles in passing legislation. Johnson cautioned against moving spending bills without passing a rule, as it would require support from two-thirds of the House, which is challenging given the narrow Republican majority. A jury in Manhattan found former National Rifle Association, NRA, Chief Wayne LaPierre guilty of mismanaging the organization and costing it millions of dollars through wasteful spending to support a lavish lifestyle. They recommended that LaPierre repay $4.35 million. Former NRA Treasurer Wilson Phillips was also found liable for mismanagement and was recommended to repay $2 million, while another defendant, John Fraser, was not found to have harmed the group financially. New York Attorney General Letitia James brought the civil corruption case against the NRA, accusing its top executives of diverting funds for personal luxuries. LaPierre, who resigned in January after more than 32 years as chief executive, faced possible removal before the trial. The NRA, once a political powerhouse advocating for gun rights, has faced financial struggles in recent years. The organization stated that it had been victimized by former vendors and insiders. The jury deliberated for five days before issuing their recommendations. The NRA, a New York registered nonprofit, has been under scrutiny for its charitable spending. While James originally sought to dissolve the NRA, a judge ruled against it in 2022. In testimony, LaPierre admitted to shortcomings in disclosing personal vacations and financial dealings but argued that the organization had made efforts to improve accounting practices. Former President Donald Trump has promised a new round of tax cuts if he secures the presidency again, building on the tax legislation passed during his previous term. Speaking at a rally in South Carolina, Trump assured the audience of additional cuts and a new economic boom. He emphasized a commitment to raising tariffs on foreign countries while significantly lowering taxes for American workers and families. Trump's previous tax cut law, passed in 2017, has faced criticism for favoring wealthy individuals, real estate investors, and business owners over middle- and low-income households. Some provisions of this law are set to expire in 2025, requiring congressional action for renewal or expansion. Trump's proposal to maintain the corporate tax rate at 21 percent, instead of lowering it to 15 percent, has been mentioned privately, aiming to appeal to a broad base of supporters. Despite past criticism, Trump's tax cut policies have garnered support from certain business groups, donors, and voters. The former president's focus is currently on securing the nomination before pivoting toward a potential general election rematch with President Joe Biden and addressing ongoing legal challenges. Alexander Smirnov, a former FBI informant charged with falsely implicating President Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden in receiving bribes from a Ukrainian energy company, was arrested again due to concerns about his ties to Russian intelligence, which the government believes make him a flight risk. Smirnov, who was indicted on February 15 and released on bail two days prior, was arrested during a meeting with his attorneys. This development is the latest in a complex case surrounding Smirnov, whose indictment debunked a conspiracy theory that prompted a House Republican probe into the Bidens. The arrest warrant was issued by the federal court in Los Angeles, where the case against Smirnov was filed. The Justice Department confirmed Smirnov's custody but declined further comment. Prosecutors argued that Smirnov's extensive foreign ties, including connections to Russian intelligence, and his allegedly misrepresented assets pose a flight risk. They claim he failed to disclose access to over $6 million in funds. Smirnov's lawyer argued that the circumstances of his arrest contradict concerns about flight risk, noting that he was attending a legal consultation when apprehended. 
Smirnov, a longtime FBI informant, allegedly fabricated claims about the Biden's involvement with a Ukrainian energy company, which the special counsel deemed false. U.S. defense officials are worried about potentially losing crucial military access in the Pacific region, which could be ceded to China due to a funding delay in Congress. The issue revolves around the compacts of free association, COFA, agreements with Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, which grant the U.S. exclusive military access in exchange for aid and services. Despite an updated agreement securing $7 billion in U.S. support over 20 years, Congress has not yet approved the funding. This delay puts American military access at risk, affecting security concerns regarding competition with China, the maintenance of existing defense sites on the islands, and U.S. credibility in the Indo-Pacific region. China's increasing influence in nearby island nations has heightened concerns, with some countries reconsidering their diplomatic ties with Taiwan in favor of Beijing. Despite bipartisan support in Congress for passing the agreements, disagreements over funding offsets have stalled progress. The longer the delay, the more pressure leaders in the COFA nations face to reassess their relationship with the U.S. On the second anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg expressed confidence in Ukraine's future membership in the Western Defense Alliance. Stoltenberg stated, Ukraine will join NATO. It is not a question of if, but of when. In a video message, he emphasized NATO's commitment to stand with Ukraine and highlighted the severity of the situation on the battlefront. Stoltenberg praised Ukrainian forces for their achievements in reclaiming territory, pushing back Russian forces, and inflicting heavy losses on the invaders. He also mentioned the substantial aid provided by NATO countries to Ukraine, including equipment, ammunition, and financial support, with a promise of more assistance to come. Stoltenberg's message underscored NATO's solidarity with Ukraine and its determination to support the country's security. The Biden administration has announced new trade restrictions on 93 entities from several countries, including Russia, China, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, UAE, Kyrgyzstan, India, and South Korea, for supporting Russia's war effort in Ukraine. These restrictions essentially prohibit U.S. shipments to the targeted entities, which include 63 from Russia, 16 from Turkey, 8 from China, and 4 from the UAE. Alan Estevez, a U.S. Commerce Department undersecretary, emphasized the need to continue showing resolve and support for the Ukrainian people in the face of Russia's ongoing war. This move brings the total number of entities listed over Russia's invasion of Ukraine to 900. It is part of the latest round of sanctions by the United States, its partners, and allies in response to Russia's actions in Ukraine, which began on February 24, 2022. The U.S. has also imposed sanctions on over 500 targets related to the war and the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. The European Union recently approved additional Ukraine-related sanctions against Russia, targeting nearly 200 entities and individuals accused of aiding Moscow in procuring weapons or being involved in the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. Some of the entities listed in the recent announcement were companies implicated in diverting controlled microelectronics to Russia's military and intelligence authorities. While others were targeted for procuring American equipment to help Russia replenish its military supplies. One of the listed entities is UAE-based Krynofist Aviation, which provides spare parts for airplanes. Krynofist was added to the list for efforts to divert American items to Russia. Stephanie Luz, Denmark's new economy minister, believes that Europe cannot rely on increased state aid to compete with the US and Asia in the long term. In an interview, she expressed concern that competing based on the size of state subsidies would not be sustainable, especially given the debt situation in many European countries. Luz emphasized the importance of fostering real competitiveness through reforms that support growth and development, rather than simply investing in new initiatives. She cautioned against relying too heavily on state aid, as it could lead to increased internal competition within Europe rather than strengthening the bloc's ability to compete globally. Despite this, Luz acknowledged that Denmark has implemented subsidies, particularly in wind energy and green hydrogen technology, to prevent companies from relocating to other European countries. She stressed that this approach is not ideal and could ultimately undermine Europe's collective interests if it only serves to shift investment between member states. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has traveled to Kiev, Ukraine, to commemorate the second anniversary of the Russian invasion. Von der Leyen's visit aims to honor the resilience of the Ukrainian people and reaffirm the European Union's unwavering support for Ukraine.
She emphasized the EU's commitment to stand by Ukraine financially, economically, militarily, and morally until the country achieves freedom. The anniversary is marked by various events both inside and outside Ukraine. The full-scale invasion, ordered by Russian President Vladimir Putin, began on February 24, 2022, with Russian forces initially advancing on multiple fronts, including towards the capital. Kiev Despite significant Western assistance, including military and financial aid, Russia still controls a considerable portion of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea, annexed in 2014. The anniversary coincides with a critical time for Ukraine, with Russian troops making progress in the east after a prolonged stalemate. Ukrainian forces recently withdrew from the town of Avdiivka following months of heavy fighting. Additionally, a $60 billion U.S. aid package crucial for Ukraine's defense, described by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky as of fundamental importance, is currently stalled in the U.S. Congress. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine, Europe's largest, is reportedly at risk of a potential disaster due to the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. International monitors, Ukrainian officials, and the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, Rafael Grossi, have expressed deep concern about the situation at the plant. The facility has experienced shelling, staffing issues, power outages, and difficulty accessing cooling water, raising fears of a potential meltdown. The destruction of the Kakovka Dam has also impacted the plant's cooling capabilities. The IAEA has emphasized the dangers of a direct attack on the site, and Grossi likened the situation to the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster in Japan. The Zaporizhia plant is under the control of Russian forces, and concerns about the lack of qualified staff, maintenance, and potential safety risks persist. The ongoing conflict and degradation of the facility raise serious worries about the possibility of a nuclear disaster in the region. Manfred Weber, leader of the European People's Party, EPP, has warned that the European Parliament could face blockages if far-right parties gain seats in the upcoming June elections. The far-right groups are forecasted to make gains in countries like France, Germany, Poland, Hungary, and the Netherlands, potentially impacting the pro-European majority that has shaped EU policies. Weber expressed concerns about the implications for supporting Ukraine, achieving climate goals, and addressing migration. He ruled out forming coalitions with certain far-right parties and emphasized his red line of being pro-European, pro-Ukraine, and pro-rule of law. The EPP currently holds 177 seats in the 705-member EU parliament. Ukraine's parliament has passed a new law on lobbying, a move seen as a key step ahead of the country's EU accession negotiations. The law, recommended by the European Commission, defines lobbying in line with international practices and standards. The legislation aims to reduce corruption and the influence of oligarchs on state management by introducing transparent and open rules for legal influence on Ukrainian state policy. The law also includes the establishment of a mandatory transparency register for individuals interacting with politicians and officials for commercial interests. Political parties, media, religious organizations, and election candidates are barred from serving as lobbyists or promoting their interests through lobbyists. Britain has announced a new £245 million, $311 million, defense package for Ukraine on the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. The funding will provide urgently needed artillery ammunition, adding to the recent delivery of 200 Brimstone anti-tank missiles. This brings the total number of missiles sent to Ukraine to over 1,300. Additionally, Britain will co-lead an international coalition supplying thousands of drones to Ukraine. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak emphasized Britain's commitment to standing with Ukraine, declaring that life will win over death and light will win over darkness. The UK has also pledged £8.5 million to the Red Cross and the Ukraine Humanitarian Fund to support emergency responses and humanitarian assistance across Ukraine. Former head of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, emphasized the need for the European Union, EU, to rapidly finance massive investments to catch up with global economic shifts. He discussed the challenges during a meeting with the EU's finance ministers in Ghent, Belgium. The war in Ukraine has pushed defense spending to the top of the agenda, and Draghi highlighted the importance of bold action to cover the costs of green and digital transitions, as well as defense, while maintaining Europe's social models. Options discussed include a dedicated fund, public-private partnerships, and joint EU borrowing to finance priorities.
The United Arab Emirates, UAE, has agreed to invest $35 billion in Egypt, a significant breakthrough for Egypt as it grapples with its worst foreign exchange crisis in decades. The investment includes developing a premium area on Egypt's Mediterranean coast known as Ras El Hekma, with Abu Dhabi Wealth Fund ADQ leading a consortium to develop the region. The agreement, described by Egypt's Prime Minister as the biggest deal in the country's history, includes a $24 billion purchase of Ras El Hekma development rights and an $11 billion investment in additional real estate and prime projects in Egypt. Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva has accused Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians, echoing earlier controversial remarks comparing Israel's actions in Gaza to the Nazi Holocaust. Israel has strongly rejected these claims, asserting that its military operations target Hamas, not civilians. The ongoing conflict has led to a significant civilian death toll in Gaza, with the health ministry reporting over 92 fatalities in the past 24 hours alone. Meanwhile, efforts to negotiate a ceasefire continue, with mediators from the United States, Israel, Egypt, and Qatar meeting in Paris to seek a resolution. Israel has vowed to pursue its military campaign until total victory, but has also engaged in talks to secure the release of hostages held by Hamas. In addition to the conflict, tensions have risen over Israel's plans to construct over 3,300 new homes in West Bank settlements, drawing criticism from the United States and prompting the Biden administration to reaffirm the illegitimacy of Israeli settlements under international law.